Hey folks, we're here in Salt Lake City, Utah at the Utah Air Guns Rocky Mountain Air Gun Challenge. And behind these doors, world famous sniper Jim Smith is holding a school for our events attending air gunners. If you're unfamiliar, Jim's been awarded the Purple Heart and the Silver Star for his heroics at the Black Hawk Down incident in Mogadishu, Somalia. Coming up. AEAC is made possible by JSB Match Diablo, H&N Sport, Predator International, Air Arms, Crossman Corporation, Daystate, FX Air Guns, Sports Match Rings UK, Rapid Air Weapons, and Aztec Optics. And you guys know the best way to thank them. <laughs> thank you. Well, good to be here. Welcome. How about a round of applause for Utah Air Guns? <laughs> First of all, I want to talk a little bit about who I am, and then from there on, we're going to do a class on uh, rigging the rifle, a class on ballistics. Did anyone bring firearms to shoot today? Anyone? One, two, three? Okay, we can go outside and do some shooting. We have some targets set up, I believe, some still targets. Can anyone remember the movie Apocalypse Now? I'm gonna date myself, aren't I? Yeah, yeah. I saw that movie. Uh, I was born and raised in Southern California when it used to be paradise. It was Republican, you know, very conservative, a great place as a kid to be raised. We could literally ride our horses 50 miles in one direction, no fences, shoot out the back door. What a great place for a kid who likes to roam. My dad started me backpacking the Sierras at age five, which developed my love of wild spaces, mountaineering, and what I came to do further in the military later on in life. So I saw the movie Apocalypse Now, went to the recruiter, says, you know, I'm in a junior college, this is just like high school, I need to get away, grow up a little bit. What do you got for me? And I said I wanted to be Special Forces. You know, that's what the guy in the movie was. Well, at the time, they weren't taking people off the street and Special Forces. They said, I got something better for you. You can be an airborne ranger. And in theory, it was a lot better for a young man. It taught me two core principles that have stayed with me my whole life. Attention to detail and discipline, right? What we want to teach your children at any point. Attention to detail, knowing how to do a task and doing it correctly. Too often when I teach military in pre-deployment courses, one line I like to use is the devil is in the details. When those fine details are forgot, men and women die overseas needlessly, okay? Discipline, knowing how to do the job, may be more difficult to do it the correct way, but do it the correct way. So those two core principles have stayed with me my whole life. So I was in the Rangers initially. Then at the time, General Abrams decided to make the Army better. He'd put Rangers throughout the Army in leadership positions. So the Cold War was still going on in Europe. I was assigned as a LERP team leader in Germany. In theory, if the Russians invaded Europe, we would pop up behind the lines, me and my five teammates, and report on what the Russians were doing, calling in airstrikes and whatnot via AM radio. Kind of a neat place to be as a young man. Because all my life I've tried to look at whatever is available and do everything I could that was fun, adventuresome, exciting. So in Europe, I did the Hout route. Anyone know what the Hout route is? It's a major ski tour, takes about 10 days through about seven passes from uh, Zermatt, Switzerland to Charmaine. I climbed the Matterhorn, the Eiger, Mont Blanc, several lesser peaks in Germany. Went up, we tried to climb Trollwegen in Norway in the winter. Just whatever there was to do, I went out and did. Why? Because I want to experience everything I can in life. So Europe was a good assignment. From there, I went from being a LERP team leader to actually being an instructor in the International Long Range Patrol School. It was run out of a German base administered by the 2-2 SAS. You know who they are, right? Well, after working with them a year, they asked me, Jim, why aren't you in Delta Force? You should be. You do everything we do, and we think you'd be a good fit for Delta Force. Well, I went to a recruiting briefing early on in my career, but I wasn't eligible to go because I'd been in the Army not long enough. So they actually called a guy back in Hereford who was on exchange program in Britain from Delta Force, figured out the route for me and called the recruiter for me. That's how, how much they wanted me to be in Delta Force. 
At that point, you did a series of uh, physical fitness tests, psychological battery, you know, you did three different psychological tests, and that just got you in the door to go to selection. Selection was in West Virginia for four weeks. Usually a selection class, I canvass the whole military twice a year, and they'll get every candidate who just decides they wanna to go to selection. They may have two to 300 people. Some selection classes only end up with one individual, okay? My selection class, we had 12 guys who passed the selection. Then from there, you go back to your old unit, you process out, you transfer to Fort Bragg, and then you go through a six month training course learning every skill set that a Delta operator needs to learn, okay? People don't know how selective Delta Force is because you don't hear about us that often. Have any of you guys heard about Delta Force that much? Not like our brethren of the Navy, the SEALs, okay? In SEAL training, they have an actual block of instruction on how to write a book, how to falsify your memoirs. <laughs> I'm joking. But again, SEALs are more like, more like the Army Rangers or our Special Forces. They're fairly common. There's been probably 50,000 SEALs ever. The select group of the SEALs would be SEAL Team 6. So they'd be more on a par with Delta Force. Delta Force has been about 12, 1,400 operators ever. So it's a very, very small group of people. Okay. I was both an assaulter and a sniper in Delta Force. I saw combat a few different times. In Somalia, most notably, I was on uh, Helicopter Super 6-1 when it got shot down as a primary sniper on that. You know, for me, Delta Force was a great place to be. You're working with professional individuals, you're equipped with all the best equipment, and generally most of the missions were pretty, pretty spot on missions you'd want to be on. After Delta Force, I wanted to get away. So uh, we had preferential treatment for assignments. So at that point I said, hey, I want to go to Alaska. There's a special force position in Alaska. It's in Nome, Alaska. Anyone where Nome, know where Nome, Alaska is? It's where the earth drops off. And so I was an advisor to a National Guard battalion uh, compromising Eskimo scouts in the north and Athabascan Indians in the interior. What a great place to rehabilitate and become human again, you know. I was a little bit jaded after some of the stuff I saw and it was good to get away and kind of work with these people who are a little more simple, a little more down to earth. Really was good for my soul. While in Alaska, I uh, became an apprentice as a Big game guide, and then started my own big game guide business. Ran that for about 10 years. Shot in excess of 60 brown bear. Lots of moose, caribou, all that kind of stuff. Dollar sheep. I love to hunt. Hunting's been a passion all my life. From there, I retired out of the military and then went overseas as a contractor, working for Brown and Root, making some pretty good money, uh, in charge of a security of a base, all the employees. Shortly after that, 9-11 happened and I was going overseas with uh, the CIA. I was calling to verify some backgrounds of the people I'd be working with, and I instead got invited to be on the Air Marshal program. So me and seven mates wrote the whole program to start the Air Marshals back up from the ground up. At that time, there were 33 Air Marshals, and it was more like a men's club. You'd kind of decide, okay, where do you want to go today? Well, let's go to Aruba. You know, it was the threat-based mission principal unit it was just kind of a screw off unit. So we wrote a training program similar to what we had in Delta Force. And at the time we had the highest level of uh, firearms marksmanship for pistols of all law enforcement because the program we wrote. Unfortunately then, since it was a new agency, they had to determine who was gonna actually be in charge of it and they put the Secret Service in charge of it. And these old Secret Service guys watered it all down. Just totally changed the program but it's still a good program to fight terrorism in the skies. What a capable weapon, taking an aircraft and using it as an ICBM, right? I mean, we saw 9-11, how possible that is. So I did that for several years, was in charge of all the training in uh, one major field office, 300 agents. From there, I moved to Dallas and was just in charge of the firearms program. 2006, I got sick of working for anyone and I quit and just, uh, kind of went back in the Army as a contractor. I was invited to be part of the Asymmetric Warfare Unit, a unit that was compromised of half retirees, contractors, and half active duty people. They determined that you could let so many people out of the military with so much experience, why not embed them in units and draw on that experience? A senior sergeant major embedded with a, with a unit in theater, you know, in Iraq or in Afghanistan, draw on that guy's experience. 
and most of us were Delta Force or senior SEALs. The program I was attached, it was three of us who initially started it, Mike Pannon, uh, Jim Smith, and Pat McNamara, was called CAT-C, Combat Applications Training Course. Our mission statement was this simple, change the way the Army trains. Okay, that's like taking a, a battleship or an aircraft carrier with a canoe paddle and steering it, you know. So we went back to our core principles. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to either make some type of a training course and highlight the methodology we trained with back in Delta. Because Delta would bring in all the world greats to train us. And if they start to talk about tactics, we say, no, 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 you stay in your lane. You're a competitive shooter. Don't mention tactics. We know tactics. Teach us how to shoot faster. You follow me? So we developed a five and a 10 day carbine training course. It was free to the units. The units could come. It was established for 40 young men and women from the battalion trained the junior leaders. We were going hit and miss throughout the Army. We knew we had a good program because after five days, the guys could shoot dramatically better. Everyone knows what a minute of angle accuracy is? You know what a minute of angle accuracy of, of a decent infantry battalion is? Four to six minutes of angle. A support unit, 10 minutes of angle. We could get them down in two minutes of angle in five days. Okay? Two core principles we worked on, lethality and survivability. When they pulled their weapon up, we wanted to be more, lethal, more lethal, drop every target they were aiming at, and be more survivable. They're using techniques and principles, so when they get in that armed engagement, they're able to come home safely. Okay. When we went to Fort Bragg the first time, it was 2006, and I was pretty, pretty amazed that the division, came out, division commander came out the first day. Who was that guy? Uh, he's since gotten some trouble, but it was General Petraeus. He stayed not like normal commanders will come out and shake hands, give out a coin, and just take a photo op. He stayed four hours on the range. He wanted to find out what these Delta operators are doing for his battalion, one of his battalions on Fort Bragg. Day two, his number two in command came out, his DCO, stayed all day till 10 p.m. Day three, we heard, you're going to be here in Fort Bragg every battalion that deploys to Iraq will get this training. So it kind of put the training on the map, how important it was. So we stayed on. Fort Bragg did 14 of these courses in all 2006. The war was ramping up in uh, Iraq. 2007, we went to the 101st Airborne Division, Fort Campbell. Stayed there all year. 2007, I said, screw it. I'm going to go private. I'd been running Spartan Tactical a couple years on the side. Went private. I've consulted for many companies over the years. Uh, the biggest is probably Remington Arms when they brought out their MSR. We worked on my range many, many weeks, shooting long range, 1,500 meters. Uh, Loophold and Stevens, the Optus company, I consulted for them for 12 years. All their major military scopes I've worked on from the initial kind of inception phase all the way to the testing and the placement phase of that optics and a lot of other companies over the years, okay. I've had two FX air rifles, and I'm really excited for the last six months. I've been shooting the impact, and uh, I want to get better at it so I can develop a training program for long range using the air rifles. I told Justin early on, when I went to my uh, Special Forces Sniper School, we had decent air rifles of that era, RWS, and I signed one out and trained for about three, four weeks before I went to the sniper school and I was number one in my sniper school. I attribute a lot of that to all that practice I did at home, you know. So uh, that's that. We do probably, used to do almost solely military courses through about middle of 2013 with the war paring down. We're doing about 15% military, probably 40% uh, law enforcement and the rest of civilian courses. I'm set up on a big range complex in Texas, North Central, Crescent, by Fort Worth, where we have about 3,500 acres and three or four ranges out to over 2,000 yards. So it's pretty cool to have that much space. In my area alone, I've got probably 150 targets set out, steel targets. So we can jump from venue to venue to venue very quickly and accelerate that learning curve so much quicker. You know, There's so many people coming out now and setting up training companies, but do they have the experience and the scope of what me and some of my peers do who've been doing this a while? I think that's probably good enough on the bio. Questions? 
Let's talk about rigging. I'm big on talking about principles versus technique. What do I mean by principles versus technique? Can somebody give me what an idea of a principle is versus a technique? I want to pick on you right here. <clears throat> principle would be the, I'll help you, the underlying law, the rule, the military would call it the doctrine. Why we do something, the technique would be the how. You follow me? Okay. So when I talk about anything, I like the guys to know the principles. Because if you get lost, you can always go back to your principles and why you should be doing it and then determine how. You follow me? When I teach law enforcement, I tell them, I can send it, you can send a guy to a course and this guy may say, okay, every time you clear a corner, if it's more advantageous to go left-handed or right-handed, switch the rifle from side to side. Do you follow me? Does that make sense with all law enforcement agencies? Yeah, if it's a SWAT team who has five training days a month, it does make sense. But for an agency, the patrol rifle program, where the guy gets to shoot maybe once a month, it doesn't make sense to teach that kind of a te technique. You follow me? Techniques got to apply for your, the, your individual, your equipment, and your surroundings and scenario. Okay, good. Let's talk about rigging the rifle. Again, I'll talk about optic initially. Optic. How do we want to set this, this optic up initially? Probably one of the first things is where I'm going to place the rifle, the optic on the rifle. You follow me? So I'm going to turn it to max magnification and get whatever my most common shooting position is. Shut my eye, get comfortable, the good cheek stock weld, open my eye. If I don't see what? A full scope of light, I need to move the optic fore or aft. You follow me? Okay. And you guys, you guys are experts at this. I'm sure you can teach me a lot on air guns. So if I've got to move my head forward, where does the optic have to come? Back and vice versa. You follow me there? Okay. Parallax. How do we adjust parallax? Or how do we adjust diopter? Yeah, pointed it. Yeah, maximum power. Okay, shut your eye, open your eye. Your eye is going to adjust very, very quickly. The younger you are, the quicker your eye will adjust, right? About a tenth of a second. So if the reticle is not crisp and clear immediately, then make that adjustment. Where does your your parallax be needs to be when you're doing that? Probably in infinity max. Okay, so. Max, looking at a neutral background, shut my eye, open my eye. If the reticle's not crisp and clear, adjust in or out until it is, correct? Okay. I know loophole for us guys who are older, we got to adjust it which way usually? Out a little bit, right? Okay, this way, counterclockwise. Good. From there, what do I need to adjust? Yep, you can't. So what are my ways that I can adjust my reticle for canned? Usually a plumb bob or what? A level. Why is a plumb bob probably better? Yep, I hang a stone with a piece of cord and I can look at it and it's going to be perfectly... Yeah, gravity don't lie. When I'm in, in the shop, I'll sit there and rough do it with my little level, level the action, level the scope, level the action, but you got to check it on a plumb bob. Good. Okay. Uh, by spec, a radical can be off from the factory three degrees. I know loophole spec, three degrees. That's fairly dramatic, three degrees, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. What else do we need to set up on the rifle? Yep, yep. Mounts. What's our mounting torque? Yeah, 20 to 26, depending on whose tool you're using and whose rings. And then what's on these? 65 on, I know, the actual major rifle rings. Okay. 28. 28? Yeah. 28. Yep. Different, different companies spec it different. I think Leupold says 26. What's that? Athlon optics, I know they specify they don't want you going over 20 inch value. I know I've done courses for Leupold engineers, 12 engineers, and I show them how a soldier commonly does it, and they'll say, <laughs> <laughs> and when I, teach, when I teach guys who don't have torque instruments, I say, okay, there's finger tight, 
There's hand tight, there's wrist tight, and then there's retard tight. And I, I'm not knocking retarded people, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, and soldiers will commonly put about 45, you know, inch pounds on there. Loophole commonly gets a lot of broken rings back because the guy uses what? 65 foot pounds. He said, well, you said it was 65. Okay, so you check that. Now you guys, I guess there's not any action screws to worry about. Like with long guns, we worry about action screws being torqued in. And I've talked to some Olympic shooters who will actually start at 65 inch pounds and then go up in quarter pound increments and check groups every quarter pound increment. And they find there's a sweet spot at some, some point. You follow me? Yeah, fairly precise, but yeah. okay, good. Okay, optics. I don't know if we need to go into the full optics thing. Let's talk about it, why not? What the heck? First focal plan or first or second? You asking us a choice? Well, because see, I don't know your world so well, so your world may be different than mine. Go Bring ahead. It Bring it on. What do you got? Second focal plane. Second focal plane. Okay, what are the benefits? The benefits are the radical stays at a consistent. Consistent. Yep. Um, that uh, as long as you're decent at mass, you can mm -hmm. just cut things in half or double them, something simple like that. But the biggest thing is that my radical does not disappear when I go down the low magnification. It drives me crazy. It allows you to have actually take longer shots because if you lower your magnification, you can still see the radical, correct? Okay. 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 In my in my world, first focal plane, I can mill and and size the target at any magnification. Okay. And your holdover never changes. My holdover never changes. Like where we had to go too often, the army was was rigging uh, the knight's rifle with a three and a half to ten second focal plane. So what happens when we put a night optic in front of it? We can't shoot it at 10. The thermal gets too grainy, the night vision is too grainy. So then we gotta figure out where exactly half and double our holds are, you follow me? But if you look at the dial on, on half, you can't trust that. Because that was put in a device and lays necessarily. So we gotta take a paint pen and actually on a target, scale it to make sure we're exactly at five power, put the little dot there, and then the sniper can go at night to five power use the same holds if he doubles them, you follow me? But again, the problem with a lot of radicals at low power, like I say in a three and a half 25, at three and a half it's almost unusable, okay? Now in my world with carbine optics, are you waving at me? My, my world with carbine optics, my preferred is a loophole mark six, one to six. At one power, I can still shoot a small steel plate at 300 yards. Pretty amazing at one power at that optic. But then I can go up to six, and then I have an actual ballistic reticle that I happen to draw for our guys going to Afghanistan that we can use out to, uh, with the 5.56 version, 900 meters, the 7.62-1200 with wind holds and a lot of other data. Yeah. So let's raise a hand. Question, sir? <laughs> I don't know who does that. Does anyone do that? Because the other way around, for, because adjustments were always in MOA, reticles were always in mills. And that screws me up even today because I do everything mill, mill generally. And so I'll have a shooter who can't get enough adjustment, and I'll say, well, just hold this much, thinking in mills. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's difficult because they're speaking different languages. So generally, I know all Loophole's product line is mill, mill, or minute. Some of the older ones mill still, but all the newer ones are mill mill. Mill radiant adjustment, mill radiant reticle. Now they have brought out some new radicals that are MOA. What? If they would do them both the same. Mm -hmm. I think it's just the development. A mill reticle was brought from the military how many years ago? Who's the oldest gentleman in the group? <laughs> 30, 40 years ago, yeah. I mean, because I think about my era in the development. We had SR25s early on. I was a varmint hunter. I had three and a half to 10 uh, very X3s. You couldn't get a mill dot back then. You sent it back to Premier Reticle, they put the mill dot in it. I was the first guy to put that optic, a variable powered optic on a gas gun, a semi-auto rifle. 
Our armor said, oh, no, they'll never hold up. They'll never work, you know. Well, no, I'm going to try it. And we saw with, at the time, our Simrad was our night vision, that when we went from 10 power to 3.5, it didn't get three times better. It got five times better. Our field of view was dramatically better. What is a sniper supposed to do? Support the salters. If I can see more, I can see bad guys approaching on my men downrange, I can do my job better. And then the graininess of the night optic was much, much better. Now we use thermals so much more. The thermals, being a digital system, get very grainy depending on what they're designed for. Okay, I kind of digressed a little bit. Uh, raise your hands. Who uses second focal plane? Please raise your hand. Okay, first. Okay, so it's about an even mix. Yep, good. For law enforcement, when I teach them, I generally try to keep them second focal plane. Again, because the amount of training time they have, the reticle being consistent is very important to me for them because they don't have a lot of time to train necessarily. Okay. Where is the reticle on a first focal plane optic? Three minutes. Right up here. Anyone seen how small that reticle is? It's smaller in diameter than my pinky for like a three and a half twenty-five. So it's a very specialized process. They're laying that uh, that reticle on there in the submicron layers. So it's uh, one or two companies worldwide who do that. Where a second focal plane is back here. And who pioneered the second focal plane reticle? Lou Paul and Stevens did. You know, like a hundred years ago because they wanted to keep a consistent radical size for the hunter. Yeah. Okay, so on radicals, uh, why are second focal plane cheaper than first focal plane? A lot more moving parts, a lot more moving lenses, right? Good, okay. Uh, last point, second versus first. Where is the illuminated radical on a second focal plane? Right here. Where does it have to be on the first focal plane? Right up here. That's why tube diameters have got bigger. Leupold's Mark 8 went to a 35 millimeter tube to leave, leave room for the wire traces to go up to illuminate the reticle and still have enough room for all the components to move back and forth in the optic. Okay. Last point. What does a parallax actually do, the parallax will when we move it? It moves a small lens about yay far, and I'm sure different optical prescriptions move at different distances. So what is parallax? I know you guys got good, good examples. One minute. What is parallax? What are parallax just give me a, just a common example. If you're teaching, where are you, young man? If you're teaching him, what would you tell him? Okay, we're going to take a break right now. Hold that thought. Okay. The easiest definition I have for parallax is my, the line of sight from my eye to the target. The reticle is not on that line of sight. You get me? This diagram will depict it. My reticle is off that line of sight. So I'm inducing inaccuracy by having that reticle off that. How do you guys adjust parallax? Do you move your head back and forth? So we get the weapon in a stable location and I move my head across the reticle and I'm looking at a distant object and I see the reticle will swim and then I'm adjusting it to minimize the swim. Can I get every bit of swim out? No. But how do I get the last portion of swim out? Having a consistent cheek stock weld. You follow me? Okay. So then when I'm setting the rifle up with my students, I have them, I'm doing this at 100. And I'm going to have them take that wheel off and make sure that it's graduated. The 100 is truly the 100. You follow me? So the parallax is adjusted correctly. Now, I know your world parallax is a lot more important at closer range. Where I, we, I don't worry about that, you know, closer range stuff. Am I correct? Yeah. Now, what was, we had two questions. What was the one, sir? Just, uh, mine was that I'll, I'll adjust that, and then after I shoot for 20 minutes, it's, it's, uh, it's like I have to do it again. I, it's not in Which optic is it? Okay. Does anyone else have that ph phenomenon happen? It's eyeball 101. Huh? Yeah. Eyeball getting eyeball, tired? Eyeball 101. <laughs> so your eye, your eye changes at 20 Your eye changes at 20 what, what, what I 
kind of what I tell my students is that's the nut behind the trigger. You got to just adjust it just a little bit. <laughs> okay, and you had a question: Which manufacturers develop an optic that have a diopter that goes from three to three minus three plus three? Does anyone know an answer to that? Any manufacturers? I, I didn't either. I didn't know if any of the European scope companies do. We were talking about night optics. When you put a night optic on here, it changes the focal length where the actual image projects your eye. So generally, I'm doing this with a collapsible stock, an AR-15 or an AR-10 style up. And, and so we usually got to collapse the stock up position because where that impacts my eyes is going to be a little closer, putting that other thing. And I know I learned how to hunt in Germany, and the Germans are big on night hunting for wild boar, and they actually will adjust the parallax to get that proper focal length right into their eye for night hunting. Yeah. Okay. Questions on parallax? Anyone have a better definition? If you do, let me know. I learned from you guys too. Okay, good. So we talked about the diopter. We talked about the parallax. We talked about the eye relief. We talked about second focal plane, first focal plane. Uh, we talked about, haven't talked about radicals or adjustments. We talked a little bit about adjustments. Ideally, the adjustments should speak to the same language as a radical, right? So if I have an MOA radical, MOA adjustments, a mill radiant, mill radiant. Okay, that just makes common sense. A lot of different radicals. I'm probably going to use a different radical. I've used Horus radicals a lot. Do any of you guys use Horus radicals? Okay, whoa. Huh? A little bit? No? Yeah, it's basically, to sum it up, a Christmas tree style radical. So I've got bold mill lines subdivided by two tenths of a mill. So I can go one, you know, center point aim, one mil, two mils, three mils, all the way down to 30 mils. So I can do all my holding in the reticle. It's counterintuitive a little bit because as I shoot longer, what do I need to do to my magnification? I need to back my magnification off so I can see more reticle. So if I'm shooting 1500 meters, why am I going down to 12 power versus 25 power? You follow me? But again, yeah, that's basically what we use often. And then these, these subdivided left and right give me a great latitude for holding winds at extended distance. An example, when we had Remington out testing the MSR, we had to shoot groups, legal size groups, legal size pad of paper groups at 1,500 meters, and three of the days we had 50 mile an hour winds. <laughs> Think about what your wind hold is there. We're holding 30 feet off the target pretty much, you know, and we're still hitting legal size groups. Yeah. You know, so the one that blows my mind is this guy who made the two and a half kilometer shot at a, at a Taliban guy. How, how could he even get that guy in his scope? Is that what? what yeah, I mean, you can that? you can see he's dialing probably dialing a lot of it and holding the rest. Yeah. You know what I say on that shot? The guy's a very skilled marksman. Yeah. Skill took him to a certain point, and then luck took over. Yeah. You know, I shot, my, one of my two best shots was a turkey at 1,170 yards, and it was moving. It was a one-shot hit. Boom! Four spotters observing it. And another one was a wolverine. I'd been running probably two miles to catch him, and it was a 300-yard running shot on a wolverine. Yeah. And I, and I, I was stupid. I'm so going, and I whistle, and he stops, and I'm standing at one like this. So then I dropped to the prone, and just before I went out of sight, I elevated lead, boom, and rolled him. <laughs> okay, I digress. So a big thing for me in my world is uh, having a sling on the rifle, okay? And again, I'm getting an adapter for my air rifle so I can put slings on them because I want to be able to use these as a tool for my long-range training. And the difference between a sling and a not sling in my world could be a, a hit or a miss at three, four, or 500 meters, right? So what is a sling supposed to do for us? Carry some of the weight. Carry some of the weight. And then what? Yeah, okay. Support in a firing string. So I can cinch that sling down. And a friend of mine makes one of the more, probably that I've used the most, Kyle Lamb, Viking Tactics. It's a two-point adjustable because your sling is going to have different tension on whatever position you're in, whether it be in the prone, the seated, the kneeling, or the standing. And so I can put the rifle behind me, torque the sling down, climb up a roof, go over a wall, pull the rifle down, adjust the sling for standing, for kneeling, for prone, 
and it's going to be an aid. The example I like to use is I can get into seated position at 300 and hit a man sized target every shot from 300 with the sling. Without the sling, it's a little iffy. When I was shooting a lot of standing, I could shoot a target at 500 and hit almost every time in the torso offhand, you know, and the difference was the sling or not using the sling. So he's got an adapter that will connect here and bridge it out to about here where I want the sling to be a little bit further on the rifle so I can use that sling with these air rifles. Okay. Where is that? Did you get that from? Uh, G Justin said he's got one. Yeah. So I, I think it's a one-off that he's got. He's, yeah. Okay. You were talking about something too. Huh? Yeah. What's that? Well, I was going to put it here, but I can see the problems here, and I can't mount it here, of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Here, you mean? See, I want something to bridge it out here so I can attach it here, you know, bridge this to here. But, yeah. With that gun, I wouldn't. Huh? With that gun, I wouldn't. But a different gun, I wouldn't. Yeah. Okay. So then what do we have on this rifle here? Level. Why is that so important? We're talking about rigging the rifle. Can't. What's can't going to do? It's going to alter the trajectory, right? So if I can't the rifle to the right, my trajectory is going to be to the right and then downward. Yeah. Anything more than about a three degree can't, when you get down a distance, you'll see a dramatic difference. Years ago, I'd do demos with loophole and I'd get yahoos on the gun and I'd have to factor in that can't and where I told them to hold. <laughs> and then his partner comes, well, wasn't he canting the gun? Well, yeah, I just gave him the hold to compensate for the cant. You follow me? And I know it more for carbine shooting, but you roll the gun about like this, it's about a minute and a half, a minute and a half. And again, it's going to be a different with different rifles, depending on what? Your board optical offset, okay? And like this, it's about, about three minutes one way, four minutes the other way. And again, it depends on your board optical offset. But with carbines, we really work on that for shooting around vehicles, for shooting in small spaces, so we can minimize our exposure. You follow me? Okay. You know, in my world, we have suppressors. We have a lot of other stuff we can put on the rifle to aid us. In Texas, it's very liberal on shooting our uh, wild boars, you know. They're not a game species. We can shoot them year-round, shoot them at night, shoot them with thermals, night vision. So my company's got all that, so it's pretty handy. If any of you guys want to come out for a course, we do two, three-day courses on long-range pistol carbine. And if you want to do some night shooting, we do that too, right there in Texas. Okay. As far as rigging the rifle, what else would you guys talk about? Bipods, you know. Again, bipods are handy. Any bipod I like to have for rifles, I want it to be some sort of a pivot bipod. If you don't have a pivoting mechanism in my world, in the grounds like this, what's going to happen? You're going to shoot with cant, and then you're going to induce inaccuracy. You follow me? A lot of expensive bipods out there. But for me, I think for economy versus just, just use, Harris is probably one of the better ones. You know, you, you can't, yeah, for the, for the amount of money you're going to split in there. And if you got 40 or 50 rifles, you know, you need at least 15 bipods. So, yeah. I think that's probably it. I mean, my world triggers are very important. I know with these rifles, the triggers are phenomenal. I'm typically going to shoot a trigger that's going to be a lot different than most people. My 300 Magnum is about a 0.8 pound. I'm shooting 1.2 pound. I mean, people, when they dry fry it, they smile. But again, I'm shooting this on a range in a controlled environment. I'm not taking it out hunting or something else, you know. Yeah. My carbines, I like at about two pounds, but again, I fired a couple million rounds, so I can shoot a two-pound trigger. Uh, I'm partnered with Triarc to make a pistol and a rifle, and he, he shot my pistol that I currently shoot. He says, "Wow, it's just dangerous." I'm like, well, maybe, but I've never had a buck on wood, never had an AD, <laughs> negligent discharge. Okay, let's talk ballistics, guys. Who here shoots long range and I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it real long range. <laughs> you know I was going to say that. <laughs> you know I was going to say that. Yeah, to me, to me, mid range is like five to five to eight. 
long range would be from 8 to 12, then from 12 on is extended long range. Go ahead. Yeah, he's not here. Well, let's talk through it. It's a cool study. Hopefully my battery is still alive. If not, I'll do it by memory. I think my battery just died. Okay. For rifles, ballistics can be broken down into three studies. Internal, external, and terminal. Internal would be more for the rifle manufacturer or the custom rifle builder. I'm going to talk about the actual type of chamber, the bore diameter, the type of rifling. Everything you want to decide maybe to have a rifle built for you. But you as a shooter, you, once you have the rifle, that does no effect in the field. You follow me? Terminal ballistics. How do we generally check terminal ballistics? The actual bullet impacting the soft tissue. Yeah, I mean, in Texas, we use it on wild pigs. But uh, for the study of it, we use ballistic, ballistic gelatin. You mix up a gelatin, and it talks about the actual wound cavity, the temporary wound cavity, how big it gets, the permanent wound cavity, the depth you travel, all that kind of stuff, okay? Generally, if I get new ammo, I'll go out and try to find a 200-pound hog and then shoot it with it and then do the study right there in the field because uh, a hog is very similar in anatomy to a human other than the, uh, the armor, the actual the thick leather around the upper torso, but real similar. My unit developed around, it's got, since become fairly popular, the 70 grain TXX bullet made by Barnes in 5.56. That's a really good bullet. What they loaded up, they painted a brown tip to it. Very, very accurate and uh, very lethal. You know, you hit a 200 pound pig, one or two shots and you'll drop it like that. TSX, TSX bullet by Barnes, 70 grand for 223556. So internal, terminal, and external. External is what we have control on. What is the flat path of the bullet called? The trajectory, right? That's what you should have ownership on. You should know that trajectory and what's going to affect it. You follow me? What four elements of math that we need to plug into a ballistic calculator to determine trajectory? I walked out of frame. Go ahead. BC, what else? Velocity, what else? Weight, and the last of all, board optical height in my world. Okay, angle's important, but we're going to talk about angle here in a minute. But just the, the base values that I need. Okay. So I'm going to enter my ballistic calculator. And I use Ballistic AE, Ballistic Advanced Edition. There's a lot of different programs out there. I've just used this one. Jonathan Zerkowski wrote it. He's very good at updating it. The way his graphics are are very easy to use. I've used probably 10 different programs when I was did that radical for loophole. I ran six of them simultaneously and checked them. And uh, they're also similar. But this is just one I like the way it's interfaced. So how do I determine bullet weight? Weigh it. Weigh it. <laughs> Read the box. Generally, companies don't lie about bullet weight. Now, if you're going to take the velocity off the box, do they lie about that? <laughs> yeah. We just happened to pull this ammo out of the oven. And we shot it in a very long barrel. Yeah. So weight. Velocity, there's two common ways. Use a velocimeter. That's what one soldier named a chronograph. <laughs> the velocimeter is like, cool, man, I'm going to use that. Chronograph the bullet, right? Pretty simple. Fire five, ten bullets to an average. Again, with long range tests we, with Remington, we chronographed every single shot. How often should you clean a rifle? A precision rifle. Some never. Never? Probably more off, more or less often than you think. I would say anywhere from four to six hundred rounds. Whenever I have to first turn the turn the skirt. Hmm? If I have to turn the skirt to adjust the scope, it's kind of clean. Okay. And my wife, my wife likes to clean it. And and the way to determine that is to shoot it on a chronograph and you see where that sweet spot is. You know, we determined with the MSR eighty to about 140 rounds, man, it got real tight. So what did I see in the chronograph? my standard velocities got very, very close together. Okay, meaning my accuracy is higher. You follow me? Okay. So we chronograph, what's the second method to determine velocity? 
Nobody? Known drop. I got a target down range. I'm shooting at a little impact point. I'm back here shooting. I see where it impacts. I'm just going to pick a number. It impacts here. I can go down range and measure. I can mill it from here and say, okay, so many mills down and enter my ballistic calculator. My velocity is 2,850 feet per second. You follow me? Huh? Working in reverse. Because we think about math, the equation of math, we can do it many different directions. Okay? Good. BC, what is BC? Ballistic coefficient? What does it mean? How efficient the bullet flies, right? How efficient? Good. Can you true a BC? Yes, you can. We'll talk about truing in a minute. Okay, how do we generally find BC? Huh? You can experimentally. There's an old book on ballistics that talks about shooting through three by five cards, placing them every five feet, and saying, yeah. I've only read about it, I've never tried it. I'm actually a Googleologist on that. I look it up. I mean, today with Doppler radar and so many companies actually doing the math, you know, you get pretty good BCs. Okay. So BC is how efficient the bullet flies through the air. What is a G1 BC reference versus a G7? No idea. It's the shape and the model used on what's going to happen with that bullet flying downrange. Because a model could be used for rocketry, it could be used for shooting bullets. If I put this weighted object that's shaped like this at this velocity, what should it do under these controlled circumstances? You follow me? The model? The G7 is designed more for our aerodynamic, longer ogive bullets with boat tail versus a G1 is more of a fat, dumb bullet. You follow me? No. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Have a G1 or G7, whatever the rating is, I've always wondered. Yep. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to, and I'm not a good artist. This is a G1 bullet. F-350 Ford pickup. Okay. Yeah. Elongated ogive. It's a fish. I'm not a very good artist, like I said. But elongated ogive, boat tail, more aerodynamic bullet. Okay. More designed for the G7 model. You follow me? Everything today probably is going to be a G7, okay. the way the bullet is designed. Okay. So, for our present audience, what's a Diablo Pella? What? I would think that'd be you know, like a G1. Okay. I would think, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not an expert in your world. But that's just looking at it. I mean, it's, it's more like this than this, right? Yeah. G8. G8? See, I've never used G8 in my world. I, I've never used G Alpha either. Below G1. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's the short bus of the. Okay. When I'm talking to military, I talk about the uh, the bikini model and the girl has been eating too many donuts. All right. Well, I'm right? Eating more donuts than that. <laughs> okay. So again, we get that off the chart, sir. I I think you're still going to use G7. Okay, now, like if this was a 308, a 7.62 sniper rifle, say uh, M118LR, it's going to be 4.69 is my G1. What's my G7 going to be referenced? It's about half that. It's about half that. So you can really screw your stuff up if I say the G, the I'm say I'm using a G7 BC but I'm inputting a G1 BC. You, you see how you screw that equation? That's why, again, when I do this ballistics chart, at the top of it, there's a data where I can check my data, and I can't stress it enough. Check your data, check your data, check your data. If you're not getting the desired results, go back and check your data. I just had a, a hunter going to uh, Canada to shoot a very expensive, uh, not a doll sheep, a fanning sheep like a twenty-some thousand dollar hunt, and he had done that, and his data was all skewed, my data was correct, and I kept asking him, hey, and I didn't know his program, so it was harder for me to look at his program to determine what was wrong, 
after the fact, he texted me, yeah, I was headed the BC backwards. You follow me? Yep. Questions on this? Go ahead. Just, just for a note of the story, the, 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 the BC... You, were you a Marine before, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm not really a Marine. <laughs> I know you're not. I love to use Marines. Uh, no, I, I'm actually Army. I get okay. Okay. <laughs> Yes, sir. More efficient, more aerodynamic. Yes, sir. Like some of the some of the wildcats are getting above one. They're not a fractional number anymore. Yeah, yeah. What's the BC on the 30, 30 cal? Yeah. Okay. We don't. We use lab radar to get our BC. Good, good point. The BC is, is a number tied to a velocity, and it'll reference it in this. And a lot of the more advanced cartridges that have been checked with Doppler radar will show you that. At the muzzle, at this velocity, this is the BC, and it actually, the program factors that in. Yeah. Now, one of the ballistic experts in America, uh, what's his name? I'm very familiar with the man. I've talked to him many times. Used to be the head ballast station for the FBI. And the FBI is for law enforcement probably the premier agency that does a lot of the testing for him. And he has the best chronograph. So when he trues his rifle, he trues the BC and not the velocity. We're commonly in the field will true the velocity. Now what do I mean by truing? Anyone know what I mean? I can enter the math in this calculator and it won't be perfect. There will, there will be, you'll see it. And when I started shooting with programs, I was like, well, why not the math? You've got to true stuff. So generally we true where we get about <clears throat> just about transonic. So we're at supersonic, and just when we're getting transonic, and so for a 7.62, we're about 7 to 800 meters. Now, this is a good program because it'll have a big yellow line where that transonic line is, and show me right there, 945, you're at transonic. So what am I going to do to true? What do I physically do? I have a big target down there, or maybe two targets and I have an aiming point, and they'll shoot, and if they're not hitting the aiming point, maybe they're hitting here or maybe here, then I adjust the muzzle velocity to get them so that they're actually at that known distance, they're hitting where they want to hit. Refining. They're refining their data, correct. Okay. You can also true your BC using what? I don't know if I want to get into that. Your atmospherics, and I'll cover that in a minute. Okay. Yeah, I'll cover that in a minute. Okay. It's interesting you just brought that up because a lot of us at sea level mm -hmm. have different BCs in Utah. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing it. We saw it today. Yeah, we'll talk about that here next. Cool. Okay. Yep. So if, if the bullet impacts here, what do I need to do to my velocity? Huh? Lower it, lower it so it gives me more come up, so I'll hit here, right? The, the calculation. It's always backwards, and even when I'm teaching, I get it backwards, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't have enough, I didn't have enough hold, so I need to have more hold, so I need to slow my velocity down maybe 50, 75 feet per second. So then in my calculator, it'll give me more hold. Thank you. Okay. Got me there? Okay, good. Okay, concerning wind, altitude, temperature, humidity. I feel the whole room leaning forward right now. <laughs> I'm not an expert in this, guys. I just, I, I do it for a living, but David Tubb is a friend of mine when I go shoot with him, he's the expert to me, you know, okay. So of these factors here, my environmental factors that I'll encounter as a shooter that are going to affect trajectory, what is the greatest? Wind. wind, of course. Wind, right? Yeah, wind. Okay, good. What are all these factor into? Altitude, temperature, humidity, barometric pressure? Any aviators in here? Density, altitude, right? Density, altitude. So if you use density altitude 
as your environmentals, factoring a number here, all this will create a number. Then we can adjust that density altitude a little bit one way or another to true the BC. So density altitude will come up with a factor of like 2.0, 2.0, whatever. And then we can adjust that to true that BC. Okay. Where are we? Two minutes? Good. How do we determine wind? <laughs> what I teach shooters is try to feel it on, if you have exposed ears or neck, that's usually a good place because you have softer tissue here. Feel it here, okay? See it, right? At times I'll throw grass up, I'll do this. But where am I checking the wind? At the gun, at the gun, okay. Talking old school, where did we want to determine the wind? Downrange. At the target? I was a big deal at one half to three quarters. Okay, we talked about it, I'm gonna readdress it again. What degrades, muzzle velocity and what? BC, right? Downrange, both de digress, or both get worse. Digress? I'm digressing. Okay, so what's the fastest at the muzzle? The velocity. Time for a break. <laughs> okay, we're started. Right here, pink shirt. What's your name? Maroon shirt? You had a question that I didn't know the answer to. Matt, you want to speak on that? The question was, what does a BC do when you go from supersonic to, to transonic to subsonic um, with a pellet? So with the... Centerfire rifles, long range shooting, and pellets. What I found is that with the centerfire rifle, your, your BC will. Um, what, what do you say? Degrade. Degrade with, um, as you lose velocity. But with a pellet, it seems like it can be the other way around. Um, I've done some testing with the lab radar, which is a Doppler radar recently, and it seems that at subsonic velocities, the BC can get better with lower speed. So uh, it's like interesting how. <coughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. So, yeah. And we'll talk about this here in a minute, crosswind jump. Okay. So, wind drift, what is it tied to? Time of flight. Wind drift. Time of flight, right? Okay. So, we were talking about where to read the winds. <clears throat> we said here the velocity is highest, the BC is highest. Here it's degrading, here it's dramatically degrading, right? I did testing with the company on a thermal weapon site, spotting 50 cal for three days straight at 1500. And that was so cool to see that trajectory. And when I talk trajectory and wind drift, I'd like to break a trajectory into fifths. You follow me on fifths? My first fifth, my second fifth, my third fifth, my fourth fifth, my fifth fifth. What's happening here? I'm falling back to earth, right? What's my wind drift doing in here? The first fifth, you see a little movement. Second fifth, a little more. Third fifth, a little more. Fourth, fifth fifth, and it dives to the ground. So when you get that experience, get to see that, then it shows you what my wind drift is doing throughout that trajectory, right? So again, I'm gonna go back old school. About half, three quarters. You follow me on wind drift? Okay, how do we determine what the wind's doing downrange? Because we know at our position we can have an anemometer, we can do a lot of stuff, right? Mirage. Yeah, mirage, visual indicators, what else? Yeah, yeah, we give the Taliban little shirts with little wind indicators. <laughs> they wouldn't wear them, I don't know why, but you know. In Somalia, you look at Mogadishu, you can look and literally this view, see. 200 flags. I had little rags and flags hanging everywhere, so it was a sniper's dream. What's the wind doing? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. So, wind drift. Visual indicators, vegetation's a big one. Tall grasses, again, there's different grasses all over the world, and the stem is going to be different, but a good indicator is one to three miles an hour, a little bit of movement on that grass. You follow me? Okay. Smoke. From about zero to about half mile an hour, the wind will blow. Who here is from Europe? Raise your hand. 
the joke I always use is there's people in the metric system and there's, there's countries in the metric system and countries with moon rocks. <laughs> but when you do shooting equations, they make so much more sense in metric. I was just in Slovakia and in Europe doing some training, and it's just so much easier doing, you know, meters per second and all this. But I like to tease you still. Okay, so I digress. <laughs> so wind drift. Grass stalks, one to three. Small limbs on trees, again, three to five. Bigger limbs, you know, seven to ten. Major treetops beyond 10, 12 miles an hour. Again, is this going to reference everything in the world? No. But you got to have a, a place of reference to start. You follow me? And I'm a big fan of things being more intuitive. So I get on the range and ask my students, what's the wind doing now? Seven, eight, twelve. Pull out the anemometer. Ah, you're all wrong. It's only six. You follow me? So what am I training? I'm training my skin. I'm training my eyes. I'm training everything. Okay, what's the wind doing today? What's the, and the same thing, range estimation. How far is that? How far is that? How far is that? Train the eye, pull out the laser rangefinder, then check it. Before long, you're the expert. You follow me on that? Yeah. So with wind, if you have an anemometer, do that. Every time you shoot, estimate, check it, estimate, check it. I used to do this when I lived in the Arctic. <clears throat> the temperature today is minus 26 degrees. Hey, I'm within a degree. <clears throat> feeling how the, the, the cold affects the inner sinus area, your ears and whatnot. It's 40 degrees, 40 below zero. Time to go back into the cabin. Okay, so plants are a good way, smoke, trash. Mirage, what is mirage? Heat waves through your optic. Heat waves through your optic. What are you phys physically seeing? Distortion, but you're seeing the distortion or the difference between the ground temperature and the air temperature. Because where do we check the temperature? In the shade, not on a surface, but actually in the air, right? How much hotter will an asphalt road get than the air temperature? Yeah, 40, 50 degrees, speaking in Fahrenheit, hotter could be. I will. So I can't just look down there with a shotgun blast and see mirage all the time, right? I may have to hunt and peck through my spotting scope and find an area that is collecting the sun differently depending on what the conditions are. You follow me? So maybe there's some rubble from an old building, some wood laying there. Maybe there's a patch of sand collecting the heat differently. And I'm looking, and often off, if it's really hard to find mirage, I'll look where there's a shadow adjacent to a patch like this, and I'll see the mirage with that shadow background. Okay. So I'm not just doing this, I'm hunting and pecking to where I find the point, okay, I see the mirage, you got me? And I may look beyond the target too, just because I'm trying to see something of what's going on downrange. In Texas, we have a lot of mesquite trees. Do you guys know what mesquite trees are? They're a thorny, kind of a, a tree, looks similar to a pepper tree, I guess. Barbecue. Yeah, good for barbecue. But again, you'll see the branches will blow and then they'll spring back. And that springing back tells me the opposite direction of the wind's going, right? I may not see this, but when the wind stops, I'll see that dramatic movement of the vegetation. So if I'm looking down range and I got good mirage, and again, mirage is going to be tied to the temperature and the humidity will show me the mirage. What is this doing when the mirage is about like this? Called boiling, like boiling water. Generally no movement of the air, not much. Starts to move a little bit like this you know, maybe one to three miles an hour. Again, starts to move more, maybe five to seven. Starts to move like this, then you know it's a lot more. So what do I need to do if the wind's blowing this way as a shooter? Of course, hold into the wind. Well, where do we get that calculated guess? You follow me? <clears throat> Again, this program that I highlighted, and I'm not, I'm not paid to, what's that, what'd you say? Yeah, Kentucky, <laughs> Kentucky Windows. I'm not paid to talk about this, but it's really good for my world in that I can enter the wind in a diagram and enter different vectors of wind. So I can just point a button here and pull up this circle and adjust my wind angle and then adjust the velocity in the little window there. So the model I like to use when we're shooting 15, 1800 meters is fluid dynamics. 
If I had some big terrain up here, <clears throat> if I had some big terrain up here, a mountain, a ridge coming down, I'm over here, a valley coming this way, maybe another valley this way, and I'm shooting from here over to here, how many vectors of wind could possibly affect the trajectory? Could be a couple, you know, could be here, here, could be here, different updrafts. And so I just look at, okay, if the wind's coming, we're gonna say the wind's coming predominantly this way. If I had a tidal wave flushing over the water, how would the eddies of the water move? And that's the easiest model to see. You know, if you've ever fly fished or canoed or done any of that kind of stuff, you'll see how the wind moves. And so I'm just gonna grab this, my little chart, and enter a couple of factors, and what does it give me? A calculated guess, right? Yeah, okay. As a base, I always enter 10 mile an hour full cross value. So then I can go here onto my chart, and it'll give me what my wind drift is for the various distances, 10 mile an hour full value. Okay. What do I mean by full value? Fully, per directly perpendicular to the flight path of the bullet, right? So if this is my trajectory, full value is going to be like this. What's half value? Like this. You got me there. So half value is going to be at a, at a quartering angle to the trajectory. That's 90. That would be 45. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, yeah but, it, but it's still, in my world, it's going to be half the wind drift. Okay. This will be that this is. Okay, well, what about from the muzzle or from behind me? Practical, no value, but in reality, there is a movement, okay? David Tubbs wrote some very good writings. I go back to him, talks about aeronautical jump. He and his son shot identical rifles, one with a right-hand twist, one with a left-handed twist, many different times with, with very consistent wind, and you can see that there is a movement, a right-handed twist, will affect differently, just the opposite that a left-handed twist. You follow me? There'll be a little movement up and to the right where the left-handed would be down and to the left. Okay. Full value, look at my chart, 10 mile an hour, what's it gonna say it is? <clears throat> so my wind in mills at 855 is 2.6. 2.6 mils I have to hold at 855 yards, okay? So I'm holding that in the reticle. What do I do for a half value? 1.3, you follow me? Okay, do we dial or do we hold? What do you guys do in your world? Do you dial the winds or do you hold the wind? Yeah, I mean that's in my world generally we hold the wind, why? Because it's always changing, okay? Now if I got very extreme winds, like say 50 miles an hour, I may dial on 30 and then hold above, you know, say it's gusting and decreasing, dial the mean, hold when it's gusting, hold less when it's, when it's waning. Okay, good. <clears throat> Questions on wind? Right versus left twist at new value? Yeah, and we, we talked about that a little bit with you. I want to bring you in then that on the pellets. So full value. You're going to get a climb up and to the right for a right-handed twist. Left-handed twist will be just the opposite. Now, you said on pellets that it was just the opposite, correct? Yeah, well, that's, um, that would act on the center of pressure, not the center of mass. And a normal bullet would have the center of pressure in the front, or in front of the center of mass. But a pellet is the other way around. And so I haven't tested this myself, but I know quite a few guys that have gone to Ventrest World Championships, who have said that they've done tests with, and they found that it's the opposite way around with pellets. It will, the, the, the Magnus forces will push the skirt instead of pushing the front, will actually force the head, the skirt, in the opposite direction, and, and so they found it to be the opposite with pellets. So a wind from this way will push it high into the right, and a wind from this way low into the left, yeah. potentially, yeah. and it's because the, the yeah, not it's being the here, the pressure's here. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, I didn't know that, so. 
Thank you, Matt. Okay, any other questions on wind? The main thing is you need to go out and look at the Mirage and come up with a calculated guess. And in my courses, I have a sheet on both range estimation and wind. And every time you initially, through that course, when you do a range estimation, you write down estimated distance, true distance, estimated distance, true distance, estimated distance. You follow me where I'm going with this? So I see after doing this 30 times, I'm typically underestimating my distance by 15%, okay? And we're, we're using visual indicators and we're using mil, uh, the mill scale to range. You can do the same with your wind. I look at the Mirage, I think, yeah, that's gonna be about a two mil hold for 700 meters. Well, it's actually 1.2, you follow me? So I put estimated two, real 1.2, and just keep a chart there, and then I'm gonna true what my eyes see and what I'm seeing from the reading of the Mirage. Got me? Okay, good. As an instructor, I'll sit there with a shooting pair and I'll listen to their communication and then I'll let them shoot and I'll tell them what the hold should have been. And the more you do that as a tutor, your student's gonna progress quicker. You follow me? Okay, good. Altitude, how does it affect the trajectory of the bullet? Thinner air. Thinner air. So the impact's gonna be higher in thinner air, lower in thicker air, right? What happens when you're climbing the hills at 10,000 feet? You're having to process more air to get the same amount of oxygen, so you gotta breathe harder, okay? So if I zero at sea level and go on an elk hunt at 10,000 foot, take a shot without re-zeroing camp, where am I gonna impact? I'm gonna impact high, right? Okay, good. How about temperature? Very similar effect. Colder air is gonna be more dense. Hotter air is less dense. Planes don't need as much runway when it's cold. They need a lot more runway when it gets hotter. You follow me? Okay. So I zero my, uh, my sniper or my varmint gun, say 80 degrees. Don't take it out until winter. It's zero. I shoot at that cow at 300. What, what's the effect going to be? Yeah. So we said 80 to zero. That's how many degrees in Fahrenheit? 80 degrees. Our old school rule of thumb, and it's not as exact today, but it's a good way to interpret it into your mind. Plus or minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit equals about one MOA. It's actually probably today with more stable powders, a little less, three quarter to a half, but still one away is a good reference. So 80 to zero, that's four increments of 20, that's four MOA, 300 meter shot. How many inches am I going to be low? 12, right? Four times three. Did I lose you guys? No. Okay, good. Okay. It's based on the powder, and modern powders are more stable, but it is on air density too. Yeah. Okay. Older power powders weren't as temperature stable, and some powders still aren't as temperature stable as other powders. Okay. Humidity, how does it affect the trajectory? Yeah, it's a, but again, that's the least of all of these probably. If you go from, from say, very low humidity, which is 12, 13 to 100, you're going to have half, M, half MOA change, not much. And in my advanced courses, we teach you how to shoot around the bullets, or around the raindrops. Okay? It's like we shoot in between heartbeats. Barometric pressure, same thing. Thicker or thinner air, you follow me? So you, there's a chart that you can look at your altitude, your temperature, and it'll give you your density altitude. You got me there? And then uh, I've got another device. It's basically a whiz wheel. Have you guys used whiz wheels for calculations? It's a wheel with a lot of printed data, and if I line this up with my velocity and this up with the altitude or the density altitude, it'll tell me potentially, without having to use a computer, what my hold will be. It's kind of a cool little instrument if you're kind of a survivalist, don't want electronics in the mix, just use this one whiz wheel product. Yeah, okay. We talked about it earlier. Somebody mentioned angle. How does angle affect the trajectory? So what was the old hunter's rule, shooting up or down? 
hold low, right? So I got the enemy down here on the flat. I'm up here on the high ground. I laze it and it's 600. If I hold for 600, what's the effect going to be? I'm going to be high. Okay. So what is the true hold that I should use? Whatever the actual effect of gravity is on the bullet, right? So if I had big bookends and can measure this distance, this is the big force of gravity. That's what I need to hold. If this distance is really 400, then I need to hold 400 and not 600, okay? Most range finders have a TBR, true ballistic range, fa factored in, correct? Again, people dramatically overestimate angle. Do you guys remember the uh, old school uh, protractors for navigation? We used to use those with a little fishing line on it and hold that and you could measure the angle. What do the, the new phones have today? You swipe your compass to the left as an inclinometer, you can use it to hang pictures or to sight down and check your angle. <laughs> So you can check your angle there, and this program has it in there. You just tilt my program, it'll tell you what the angle conversion is, okay? Again, I'm a guy who likes to have factors so you can wrap your head around the math of it. You follow me? So the FBI made a chart. The chart was 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and 60 degrees. 30 degrees is about like this, say. 45 and the 60s, I mean, I could base jump off 60. It's pretty steep, you know, okay? So 30 degrees, how much hold am I going to hold? 90% of the hold, okay? Now, again, I'm referencing this from the FBI's chart on 308 kind of police stuff. Every, every cartridge, the, the velocity is going to change it. This is just a rule of thumb. 45 is going to be 70%. 60 will be a 50% hold. So we're going to say this is a 30 degree angle and I'm shooting 600. What's the math? 6 times 0 0.9 is what? 540. Right? 540. 70. 6 times 7 is 402, 420. 50. 600 times 0 0.5 is what? 300. Okay, so you see the effect. Yeah. When I'm talking, I just tell people, see the angle and hold a little low. I used to laugh early on when Afghanistan kicked off. There was a range in Vermont that had a 60-foot 60, 60 tower. 60 foot. And they could shoot 500 yards. And they were claiming they had an angle fire course to get ready for Afghanistan. Well, a 500-yard shot at, at 60 foot, what's my angle going to be? Maybe 12 degrees. What's my hold going to be difference? Oh, I'm holding that much difference. So I'm really getting our troops ready for Afghanistan. You, you follow me? Yeah. So, see the angle. And our old hunter's logic was shooting up or downhill, hold low. Good. What other questions do you have on ballistics? Excellent. Go ahead. Um, if you've got two bullets with the same BC, mm -hmm. different weights, mm -hmm. fight at the same speed, will there be any difference in yeah, because the weight is going to affect the time of flight, and wind drift is based on time of flight. So the slow, the heavier bullet is going to be a slower time of flight. Are you still going the same speed? Yeah. No, yeah. no. In theory, in theory, they should be the same because it's a linear equ equation. Yeah. Good, good question. Other questions? It's about BC and the speed. Energy doesn't come into play really. Mm hmm. What's that? We'll, we'll slow down slower, won't they? So in theory, it would have less wind drift. But that's yeah. a function of the BC, so it wouldn't be any different. As long as he doesn't know what the pellet weighs, the BC doesn't know what the bullet weighs. The BC is what it is. Yeah. Hmm. Other questions? Sir? So if you're shooting out at angles, your gravitational effect is 400 yards on the bullet, but your actual line of sight is 600 yards, you've got a 30 mile an hour crosswind. You hold the crosswind for the 600, 600. because the bullet's going to travel time of flight for a 600 shot. 
Mm -hmm. How about, what am I referencing? Coriolis effect. Ooh. So if I'm shooting one direction, what is the target doing? Moving away from me, potentially. If I'm shooting the other direction, what's the target doing? Moving closer, okay? Yeah, it's about 1,500, okay? Yeah. So not pellet gun range. How about spin drift, gyroscopic spin? How much spin do we need to account for? Our old school sniper reference going back to 308.762, like a 175 grain bullet, be a half MOA at 800. Okay, so most everything in North America is right hand twist. So if I'm shooting a right hand twist, I'm going to compensate to the left half MOA. So uh, I think bullets, and that's why I'm trying to shoot. And if you sight your gun for a pellet and you sight it in zero, and then switch the uh, bullets to the same gun, they'll always shoot to the right. And I think it's because of the rifle, because if, if the bullet is spin stabilized, mm -hmm. the pellet is not. Okay, okay. And that's, that's rifled bullets for out of rifles? Okay, yeah. And I see that shooting a different 223 bullet or something, you're going to see different movements. Yeah. Now, talking about Coriolis, you know, the earth is like this, right? And we've got our lines here. So if we're shooting around the equator, the Coriolis is going to be different than if we're shooting up in the top or the bottom. But again, do we go on the top or the bottom very often? No, we don't. We don't go down here shooting penguins. It'd be fun, but we don't. And we don't go shooting up here too much because it's so cold. But if you did shoot up here, shooting north or south, you would get a Coriolis effect laterally just a little bit. But how do we generally take that out? You re-zero when you get to camp. Okay. Huh? What's that? <laughs> well, you can go over the top. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Okay, that's kind of all I planned for the classroom phase, unless you guys got anything else you want to discuss. If, say again? Mm -hmm. That's the gyroscopic spin of the, from the rifling. What about it? Okay. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't have experience in, in your world. In my world, behind a minigun, when you're shooting 2,000 to 4,000 rounds a minute, you see a cone of tracers going like this downrange. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the rate of spin doesn't slow down much, but, but the forward velocity slows down much. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the actual um, uh, ratio of forward movement to yep, the spin actually changes. Okay, so okay. It's, it's down range, as it's starting to go down, it can, it can overstabilize. Okay, okay. Especially your right hand, but it's, the speed that you're shooting. Shoot yeah. the speed to your right hand. Yeah. Now, if you look at like the AR-15 development, we started at what? One in 12, one in 14 early on. Now, what are we shooting now? One in seven, about one in eight. Twist is about optimum. So you shoot like a Steyr AUG today, it's about a one in 14 twist. You shoot it with a heavy bullet, they're gonna be keyholing all day long because it's designed for very light bullets. Other questions, comments? Awesome. Let's take a break. We're gonna figure out what we're gonna do next. You're welcome.